You know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than which Disney princess would make the best supermarket checkout operator, that question would have to be, Mark, how do you capture the visceral and eclectic blend of history and contemporary culture that is Seoul, South Korea, using a Nikon FE 35mm camera, a 35-200mm to manual lens, and Kodak Vision 3 500T cinema film? Well, today we're going to try and answer that question. So I have recently returned from Seoul, South Korea. I say recently, but it was a few weeks ago now, and things have been really, really busy. But hey, I've got COVID, so what better way to spend a Sunday morning than bore you with my holiday photos rather than actually go out and enjoy life? And I'm talking about you as well as me, since you're actually watching this right now. As for Seoul, it's always fascinated me, but I've never been there before. And that's surprising, really, because I felt this really incredible affinity for the place, an affinity that's even been recognized by others. So many people have said to me, Mark, you are Seoul. You are Seoul. And they've even shouted it out to me as I've been driving, and I drive a 21-year-old Volvo, not a Hyundai. So I've always wanted to visit, and I've always wanted to capture it on film. And I certainly did that. I'm still slowly developing all of the roles that I brought home. Today, what I'm going to do is just go through some of the photos I shot on Kodak Vision 3 500T. Now, those of you with deep pockets and a love of photographing petrol stations at night will know this stock was Cinestill 800T. But 500T is the original, the OG, the wellspring from which Cinestill was born, complete with the Remjet layer, which is designed to provide lubrication as it's fed through the movie camera, as well as anti-halation, anti-static, and scratch protection. It's also known to foul up automatic film processes, so you don't try to get this stuff developed at the local chemist. You have been warned. Now, if you've ever shot Cinestill 800T, you'll be familiar with the qualities of this film. High speed, sharp, low grain, but because they remove the ramjet layer before you shoot it, it's got this love it or hate it red blooming halations in the highlights of the image. It's a look, a pretty well documented look, um, particularly by anyone who loves hanging out around petrol stations at night. It's a bit like how dressing up as a Squid Game guard for Halloween is a look kind of cool when you see it for the first time, but then it just gets old and cheap really quickly. My motivation wasn't to lurk in neon shadows. It was simply to save money. In fact, my motivation for lots of things in life is simply to save money, but that's a video for another time. I guess the question for me was, in this dystopian nightmare of film shortages and exorbitant prices, where people are literally killing each other on the streets for a roll of Kodak Color Plus, well, okay, figuratively, not literal, I mean, I mean, it's not Kodak Portra 800, but that's the question, isn't it? 
Is Vision 3 500T a viable alternative? Will I get portrait in plain packaging or a steaming membrane of slime coated celluloid with all the quality and resolution of a 1970s VHS porn pic that's been duplicated too many times? Yes, I was 16 in 1984. Well, it was time to find out what this film could do. I grabbed my Nikon FE film SLR camera and my Nikkor 35 to 200 millimeter manual focus lens and headed out on the South Korean subway to Iwa Mural Village. Just one change and a few stops from where I was staying in Myeongdong, but a very different place with a very different vibe. Nestled on the side of Mount Naxa, it's really quite a residential area skirted by ancient walls of the city and now fairly well known actually for its street art. Um, it was painted as part of an urban renewal project in the early 2000s, though some of them have been painted back over again because strangely enough the locals didn't like the influx of tourists who descended on the community. Or, let's face it, wannabe film photography YouTubers. One, two, all right, let's get going. Now I love taking pictures of convex mirrors but they have to have someone or something inside them and here's a bike cyclist. Here we go. All right, we're moving. This is pretty cool. I'm quite enjoying this now. I wish I knew what time it is. Hang on, let me check my watch. Oh my god, I can see myself. How amazing is that? It's 11 o'clock. Jesus, I've only got an hour and a half. Okay. Let's go in here. And then. Ooh, do I do the geometry? Do I do the geometry? I'm gonna do the geometry.
It wasn't easy walking all the way up that hill. But what about Kodak Vision 3 500T? I like it. I mean, I'd already seen a lot of information about it already. It's known for producing good, fairly neutral looking colors with acceptable grain, plenty of detail without being overly sharp and having a fair amount of exposure latitude. I did shoot it at the box speed of ISO 500 and I developed it using Cinestill CS41 2 bath kit. Now that's a standard C41 color negative process and technically that's cross processing it. I should really have used the more rarefied ECN2 which is what the film was designed for. Developing it was pretty simple really. Other than the standard developer and blips, you do need to do an initial phase in the pre-wash where you add a tablespoon of sodium bicarbonate, agitate it for a minute or two. What comes out is actually pretty gruesome and I can see why labs won't touch the stuff. At the end of the process though, the negatives look pretty good. I did give it a final wipe on the non-emulsion side and that was probably a bit heavy handed. I got a few more black holes and smudges on my scans where the emulsion might have been. Um, certainly more than I liked and uh, I abused it a bit, let's be honest. And I promise Mr. Kodak, I'll be more gentle next time, okay? Some people have said that to get the best out of this film, you should really dunk it in the right suit. But honestly, I've seen lots of examples of ECN2 processed Vision 3, and they haven't really impressed me. You often see shots that are a bit muddy and with a tendency to lean into teal. And, and look, that might be the look you're after. It's certainly cinematic, but cinematic isn't pictorial. And this isn't The Matrix, or is it? Anyway, I found C41 gave a natural color palette. You've got to remember too that this is tungsten film, so it's not like there is any natural baseline to work with when you're scanning photos shot in daylight. I did struggle a little bit with choosing the right color balance. Sometimes small changes seem to throw off the color of the sky or the earth tones, but you'll notice that I had no problems reclaiming highlight detail. You can really see the texture in the clouds on which was actually a pretty cloudy gray day and there was plenty of detail in the shadows without it being too grainy. I did feel that you could tame it to a few different looks. So what's it best for? Actually, I think this could be pretty versatile film. Most of these photos were urban landscapes, but it works fine too with portraits. Skin tones are rendered quite nicely. I shot a second roll the following day and the colors seem pretty true to life. Would I use it again? Yes. Will I use it again? Not straight away. I managed to score myself a couple of bricks of Kodak Color Plus and that'll probably slake my thirst for color film for a while and at about $17 for a respooled roll of Kodak Vision 3 it sits somewhere between Color Plus and Portra so you've got to ask yourself if it's worth the minor extra effort in processing. But what do you think? Leave a comment below. Do all the other stuff. Is this something you have used or you would use? And if you do use it is it because of its inherent properties or just that you've run out of your other stock and you've already sold your youngest child for that role of Portra 800? You tell me, not about your children. Tell me your thoughts and let me know if this is something that is a good film. Have you got things out of it that I haven't? Leave a comment below. Like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this too. As for the Disney princesses, which one would make the best supermarket checkout chick? Well, I suppose Elsa would be great stocking the freezer section. Um, Rapunzel for the deli counter. Um, we'd have to make sure she wore a hairnet. You wouldn't want a long blonde strand in your mortadella. But really, if you need to clean up on aisle three, wouldn't Cinderella be ideal? Better than Snow White. She'd just outsource it to the dwarves and songbirds. Yeah. And don't put Ariel in the fish section. That'd just be cruel, okay? Next time. Mulan in the Asian grocery section, Pocahontas for the organic produce. You wouldn't get a working day out of Aurora, she'd be sleeping on the job.